teaching on faith, hope, and love. My title is Faith. Amen. Let's pray to God. Heavenly Father, fill our hearts with faith today, God. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of my charge, Such Great Faith. Amen. Such Great Faith. You don't need to turn there, but write this down. Actually, go ahead and write all my scriptures down. Praise God. <laughs> Romans chapter uno, chapter one, verse eight. It says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith, Phoenix Church, because your faith is being reported all over the world. Amen. And isn't that true today for the Phoenix Church? Our faith is being reported all over the world with dozens of baptisms, restorations. The Holy Spirit is moving through the power of God in Phoenix. Amen. The Phoenix Church is forcefully advancing the gospel, but we're far from done. We're far from done. We've got to grow to 300 disciples in the Lord. Family, faith is not what you can see. Amen. True faith is believing and acting on what you cannot see. All things that we see were born from a word, from the word of the Holy Spirit through the power of God. I remember when Telma said, I remember when Kelvin said he wanted to marry Telma. Amen. The brother came to us, he was like, I like that sister. We are like, amen bro. But he's seen it, he believed it, and he got in there, amen. He's married. I remember when I was just a broke campus brother. Kind of like Landon, amen? Tony Rivera, it, now y'all don't know Tony, y'all don't know Tony back then. Tony Rivera was very uh, kind and soft back then and, and very gentle with you, amen? But he had me, he still believed in me, so he had me come over his house for dinner because I needed uh, help with my car. And he said, he, he, he believed in me, amen? amen? He said, what you wanna do, bro, is you wanna first by starting to wash your clothes consistently, <laughs> amen? If you wash your clothes consistently, then you won't be funky, amen? <laughs> then we could talk about getting a girlfriend. Then we could talk about getting a car, amen, bro? But start there. That brother believed in the king who is here today before you. I remember when Stacy and Lynette came to the Phoenix Church and they said, guys, we're gonna come here and we're gonna have dozens of baptisms in months. And the Phoenix Church was like, amen. I was one of those people that was like, I, I love you guys, um, you know, we'll see what happens. And look at what God did through their faith, amen? God is with us. God is with us, amen? Point number one, increase your faith. Increase your faith. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 8, verse 6. Again, write the scripture down. I'm not going to wait for you. I love you. I love you. Not going to wait for you, though. Verse 6. Matthew chapter 8, verse 6. 6 through 10, we're going to read that. In verse 6, amen? The Bible says, uh, first of all, this is the, the centurion. This is the Roman centurion. Um, this was a pagan man. He didn't grow up with faith in God. And he came to God with an incredible faith. And this is what we're going to talk about here today. In verse 6, he says, um, Lord, he's talking to Jesus. He said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? Verse 8, the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am, an, am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one to go, and he goes, and that one uh, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Amen. And may it be said among the Phoenix disciples that you have amazing faith. That you amaze Jesus with your faith. 
Is that your heart this morning, family? You know, in, in uh, verse 6, this centurion man, he was born and he was probably from Rome. And he was a centurion, which means that he led about a hundred people. Okay, he had, a, he had an army of a, a hundred men that he led over. This guy had hundreds of servants. But what's very interesting is that Jesus paid very close attention to this man because he had the heart to love his servants. This is a very important man, but one servant meant a lot to him. Are you with me? Yeah. And in the same way, irregardless of where you are right now, you must understand that irregardless of how much we grow in this church, if we do not take care of the weak and the sick disciples, we are nothing. Are you with me? We must take care of the baby Christians, the weak, the sick disciples. This is how you grow a powerful church. Jesus cared about the heart of this man. That's why he blessed his faith. Amen. I want to lift up a brother by the name of Daryl. Y'all know Daryl. Daryl has been fruitful five times. Five times in the Lord. Daryl consistently shared his faith with our brother Caleb. By God's grace, our brother Caleb came back, got restored. Yes. Caleb baptized his wife. Then he baptized Darius. Darius baptized Jordan. Jordan, Darius, uh, Caleb, all of them, they baptized big boy Hunter. Amen? And then Daryl's going to be fruitful six times because Tori's going to get baptized. Amen? Little by little, are you reaching out to those who have fallen? Where's your faith at this morning? Jesus was not only amazed by the faith of this man, but he respected his love. Faith means nothing without love. Do you love deeply? Do you love deeply? Matthew chapter 8, verse 8. Uh, again, the, the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. This is incredible because he understood I don't have to see Jesus perform a miracle to understand that if his word says so, the miracle is already there. Are you with me? You must see what you cannot see. And that is true faith, family. Do you have the faith to believe in what is not seen? Many of you want to date. Some of y'all want to get married. Amen. You got to believe it. Many of you want to lead and, 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 and be appointed in certain positions in the church, which praise God. You have to see it before you can believe it. This man wasn't entitled. He wasn't entitled at all. He said, look, you don't have to come underneath my roof. I believe in your word. In the same way, you have to believe, you have to breathe life into situations. People who are struggling, you have to see them for who they can become. Amen, family? Your life and doctrine, put your life and doctrine on a higher pedestal. You are a Christian. If you are studying the Bible, you're being called to be a Christian. This is the greatest, this is the greatest person you can become in the world. LeBron James is dope, but a Christian is far more powerful. In closing, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. I challenge you to read your Bible in a year. Read your Bible in a year. There are just under 8,000, 8,000 promises in the scriptures. If you want to grow more faithful, you simply have to know more of the Bible. I challenge you, instead of, instead of binging your Netflix and TikTok and Instagram, learn promises of God. I challenge you to learn 10 promises of God before you binge on your social media. Know and understand the promises of God. Amen? There's a hero in the faith in this room, Junior Oroco. Our dear brother, Junior Oroco, gave up his prestigious soccer career, he was making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. People came to him and told him, look, if you want to be very famous, you have to do these evil things. 
because of his faith in God, he gave that up. A couple of years later, our sister Taya met him. He became a disciple in the Phoenix church. Amen. We challenged him again. Give up your life. He broke up with his beautiful, awesome fiance because she did not want God. He became a baptized disciple, did great things in Phoenix. But we said, you got to give up your life again. He gave up his life. He went over to Abidjan, Africa and Yaoundé, Africa. Who has had an AK-47 pointed at their face for the gospel? Junior has. For you to sit here comfortably in your seats for the forceful advancement of the kingdom of God. Amen. Fifteen men, fifteen men came to church to study the Bible with the heart to rob and kill Junior. One of the guys told him, we, that here's our intent. We only came here to rob and kill you, but I want to get open. Ten of those guys got baptized because of Junior's faith. Five of them left. Amen. We got to be faithful, family. Some of you need to raise up to Bible talk leaders. Some of you need to understand that we've got to give more than ever before. Persecutions may come. Hardships may come. Trials may come. But you've got to put your faith in the word of God and march to 300. Amen. Boy, he's fired up, is he not? If you guys got a Bible, please turn to Hebrews chapter 11. In a world often heavy with uncertainty, it is hope that illuminates the path before us, calling us to persevere, to dream, and to believe in a future yet unseen. Hope is not merely wishful thinking or passive optimism. It is a force within each of us capable of transforming lives and shaping dreams. It is the beacon of light amidst the darkest storms in our lives. A guiding star that reminds us of the inherent goodness in humanity. Hope propels us forward even when obstacles loom large and doubts cloud our minds. Luckily, however, throughout history, thanks to the pioneers, they have explored these lost lands to give us the hope that we have in today. We got some pioneers in Hebrews chapter 11. Some faithful pioneers. Hebrews 11 verse 32, the Bible says, And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut their mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released. So so that there might gain a better resurrection. Wow. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sought in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and goatskin, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, and in caves and in holes of grounds. That was their last week. How was your last week? Are you still struggling today with hope? These guys were literally sawed in two. I don't know which way. And people were literally had the word instilled in their lives because they were in the scriptures every single day. Yet they were killed for what they believed in. And they had people were literally disciples were walking around in sheepskin and goatskin. Today, they make Bibles out of sheepskin and ghost skin today. These people are literally living, walking Bibles, and people sought to destroy these things. Satan has a different agenda today. It's to destroy not the messengers, but the, the message. He wants to, to help us lose hope in our lives. Where is our hope today? If those followers of God who were steadfast without receiving the promise of Christ... Where is our promise now that we have Christ? To continue through trials and difficulties. We can't let discouragement or tough times defeat us, people. We got we to tell ourselves, how dare I struggle with hope? 
when Christ had just won and defeated Satan. We can't say, oh, I hope so. I hope I get, I get fruitful. I hope I have a quiet time. Brother, we have hope because God is dope. Amen? Verse 39. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what was promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us we would be made perfect. My title is Hope, A Plan for Something Better. And these great things can only be possible if we do them together. Hope is the foundation by which faith is built. It is unwavering belief that there is something greater than ourselves. Hope, according to John Maxwell, is an acronym, holding on, praying expectantly. Hope is a feeling of expectation and desire for certain things to happen. You see, God has a plan for our lives, and sometimes it doesn't match the plan that we have for our own lives. The plan for the tribe is to give the tribe tribulation. Romans chapter 5, we're going to see what that tribulation looks like. If you have a Bible, please turn to Romans 5. Verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we're also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. It comes down to hope. In order for us to become better, we have to be better. In order for a better end, we have to stick it out till the bitter end. It's through the hope and the, and the tribulations that God gives us. It's the golden chain of Christianity for us to grow and mature in our lives. In verse 5, he continues, Paul, And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. And thanks to the, the Holy Spirit being on fire with the zealous excitement for what God is doing here in the Phoenix Church, yes. all the way from the East region, let me hear from the East region. All the way down to the South region. Let me hear from the North region. The North's fired up. I believe, I believe hope. Hope is, not a, hope is not a gift. It's not a talent. Hope is a choice. What are we choosing today? Something that gives me hope is, uh, is uh, conferences that we have with the church. And... Uh, you know, I, I really wanted to make this conference awesome for, for Jasmine as a, her first international conference, going with her. And, uh, and I was like, all right, you know, I haven't been, a, been really good at planning dates, unfortunately, in my sin. And I was like, man, all right, I want to make this awesome. So I want to, like, get all these dates ready. And uh, so I got the plane, bought the plane ticket. Um, I, I, I bought her ticket with, she, with her money and uh, through my credit card. And, uh, and uh, I bought the hotel. I had everything set up. And... Uh, and then just uh, today, I was talking to a sister. She, I asked her to send me the itinerary for the, for the conference. And uh, she sent it to me. And uh, I sent it to Jasmine, you know, you know, trying to be, give her hope, you know. Uh, I give it to her, and she's like, hey, the dates are wrong. I was like, the dates are wrong? I bet we better. Oh, dang, my, dro my heart dropped. I was like, I hope, I hope they're wrong. Because uh, we looked at them, we're like, dude, they are. Like, we're, we're going there the week before. We're like, oh no. And I was like, this is bad news. Because uh, I remember buying the tickets without uh, a refund policy on them. You know, you're like, I'm not doing that. That's a scam, right? Uh, and uh, I look back, sure enough, Capital One will not refund my tickets. And uh, they said, you got to contact the, the you know, Delta and stuff. And so she's like, I'll help you. Like, I'll, I'll take care of it. I'm your helper. Get, help. Let me help you. So I, I send it to her. I'm like, all right, thanks for the, thanks for the help. Because uh, I'm busy writing the sermon, right? And, um, and uh, she calls back, not so fired up. And, uh, and she's like, yeah, I have bad news. Um, they're not going to refund our tickets, um, unfortunately. But, so, but what I did do is I emailed the people directly in hopes that in two weeks that maybe they might, with like a small percentage chance, refund our tickets. So that gave me a little hope right there, amen? And, uh, but, but the thing that, the tribulation that got me the most this week was uh, out there selling fireworks. Um, I was, uh, at first I was fired up. And, and then the work happened right there. And uh, boy, it's hot. And uh, it was hot out there. 
The first day was Wednesday. I go out there and meet up with the, the delivery guy. And uh, the tent had, it's like wooden. It's like a, about the size. It blew into a car on the parking lot. Apparently they forgot to put the, the sandbags in there. And uh, so there was a whole liability thing there and, and it was smashed. And so they're like, yeah, we can't do it. I'm thinking, dang, I wanted to get started. But, uh, but thanks be to God, I got to go to midweek that night. So I, I knew there was a better plan than what I had in mind, amen? And uh, the next day I go out and I'm just like sicker than a dog. Like I had the stomach virus uh, that the bars had. And uh, I remember, I feel so bad for, for Wes. Wes is helping me set up and I'm just like moping, like <laughs> complaining, like that I should not be out here right now. Uh, that 114 degree weather seemed like 150 degree weather when you're sick. Uh, but, but don't worry guys, it's a dry heat. So, not to worry about that. And uh, so I, I heard you can make like $24,000 on some of these tents. Um, I don't know, some people are killing it, right? And so I was like, alright, I have a lot of hope. We could do this for missions. Uh, it didn't happen in time for missions, but I was like, alright, well maybe we could do it for the interns. And uh, I talked to my coordinator for the TNT rep and he's like, yo, like, a lot of people don't do this multiple times because they kind of get discouraged with how much they make. And I was like, I don't like that. Uh, how, much, how much do they normally make? He's like, well, not 20000 but more like 3000 I was like, that's a big difference. But I'm, I was already in it. I'm like, all right, let's just go for it. And uh, so I'm in it, and uh, you know, we finished the fireworks, and I'm so grateful for all those who, who were able to help and uh, sell fireworks with us. Uh, at first, there was a slow roll. Uh, the first day, I had three customers and uh, the entire day, and one of them was Chris Schultz, <laughs> and uh, Darby, and the rest of the Schultz. And, um, and then, uh, luckily, another guy came, and he, he spent, he dropped $300 on fireworks. Nice. So that gave me a little hope, amen? Yeah. But the next few days were really slow, I was putting on uh, many hours, and then came uh, the 4th of July we, uh, day, July 4th. And when July 4th came, I was like, all right, this is the day when everyone comes to buy fireworks. And, uh, and that was a, a long, like eight, I don't know, like 15 hour day. Um, it was a lot. And uh, I had so much help, I'm so grateful for you guys because I got to take breaks and spend time with the region as we had a great region at the, uh, great party at the, the Jordan's house right there. And uh, anyways, after it was all said and done, I, I turned in the rest of the fireworks. There was not a lot left. We almost sold out, guys. Wow. Sold out of fireworks. And uh, I got all these like ones and twenties and I don't know. So I go to the bank to count them all up and um, you know, I, I added them up and it came out to only uh, like, a th I ended up owing the power company like $3,000 because I had a missing box. But from the difference from the cash, it came out to me only making about a thousand dollars, a little over a thousand dollars. And I'm thinking like doing the math, like, you know, I could do basic math. I made about $22 an hour uh, by myself, not counting paying everybody else. And so I was like, dang, Landon made more, more money than me working at Taco Bell. Uh, that humbled me. And uh, so, so in the end, I ended up uh, spending another $1,000 on, on my airplane tickets, right? But that was a wash because I made $1,000 in the, in the TNT tent, amen? And so I have faith that, and hope that God in the end is going to, to pay back dividends through my character, hopefully, amen? And uh, I'm grateful for everyone else that helped in uh, just giving their hearts as well. But uh, so guys, let us, uh, let us hold fast to hope, even in the face of uncertainty. Let us cultivate a spirit of hope within ourselves and share it generously with others. In our personal lives, hope carries the power to mend in bro broken hearts, heal shattered dreams, and breathe life into the weary souls. We were weary out there in the sun. It reminds those who lost their way that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, reminding them that joy can bloom once more. Hope restores our faith and in the inherent goodness in his church. I encourage everybody who is coming today to study the Bible, get in there. And uh, for all those who are part of the church, I encourage you to reach out for other people for hope because a little help hopes, uh, helps us with our hope, amen? So let us, let us give hope to one another and rejoice in our tribulations to have a greater plan in God's name. To God be all the glory. I get to talk about love.
Other things, and then he, at the bottom he says, this is the most excellent way, and then he talks about love. So we pick it up in verse 1. It says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. And so many of us think we actually know what love is. But a lot of what we think is based on our culture, our experiences, and watching rom-coms on Netflix. I know Tony likes rom-coms, so, you know. But that's not true biblical love. See, the only thing that the human heart can never get enough of is love. See, there's a shortage of love in this world. See, and since there's a shortage, there's something called supply and demand. See, since there's a shortage of love, people are going to any and everything just to get love. Like, think about that. We go to relationships, we go to money, jobs, careers, to popularity, and so many other things. But only one thing can fill the shortage of love, and that's the love of God. And I just want to let you guys know something. God does not care about your talent, your ability, or how good you think you are. Because if you don't love, at the end of the day, you're nothing. That's the scripture say. So imagine this. You have a faith that can move mountains. I mean, you're, you have an incredible faith that even amazes Jesus. But you don't have love, then you're nothing. Yeah. See, a faithless love is nothing but an empty, lifeless religious experience. There's, there's no real weight to it. But in Galatians 5, verse 6, it says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So if you claim to be faithful but are not loving, I'm here to tell you that you are lacking in faith. Let's say you give all your possessions to the poor. And I think this is a big one in the world today. We think that we can, we can give to people and donate different things, and that's going to fill the shortage of love. And I realized the times that I gave to other people, I was doing it from a heart of selfish ambition. It made me feel good about myself that I did something for other people. It was not genuine love because I didn't have faith, and I didn't even understand what biblical love was. Again, God is not impressed with your, your talents and your abilities. Impress God with the way that you love one another. But what does this look like? Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 to do everything in love. So anything done outside of love is just empty, vainless, and uh, meaningless to God. But verse 4, it says, love is patient. I don't think I need to read the rest. <laughs> Because we can just say love is patient and all of us are, are convicted. But I'll continue. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes always perseveres. Amen. Love never fails. See, so if you fell into love, you fell into everything else. We just become religious without love. You see, Jesus, Jesus impacted people more by the way he loved them versus his preaching or anything he ever said to them. They were impacted before he even opened his mouth because his love, like he loved so hard. Can we say the same about us? So I know for a fact that when I read this scripture, a lot of you were already convicted, like, man, I struggle with this one or that one. Right. Or some of you were like, man, I only struggle with one of them, so I'm good. It's still an A, right? <laughs> but I'm here to tell you, if you struggle with one, you struggle with all. Because love is love. So either you're unloving or you're loving. 
but you can't be both at the same time. We can't be picky with who we love. That's the Bible. Like you see, Jesus said he went to the sinners. He didn't go to the religious people because he loved everybody. And he wanted to make it clear to everybody that he loved everybody. Let's go to 1 John chapter 3. And if you want some deeper convictions on love, just read the book of John. As I was telling the brothers earlier, I don't really think I have to preach 1 John because the whole book of 1 John sounds like a sermon. And he's very, uh, he's very straightforward. And so we're going to pick it up at verse 14. It says, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. So this is how it really gets. I'm here to tell you, like, if you don't love the people around you, you're as good as dead spiritually. Hey, but don't get mad at me. That's what the Bible says. I'm just quoting the scripture. I'm not even preaching. I'm just reading the scripture. See, we can't claim to be in Christ and be unloving at the same time. Either you're dead or you're alive. Either you're loving or you're unloving. But you can't be both at the same time. Now let's look at verse 16. Because it's like, okay, bro, I don't want to be dead spiritually, so what does this look like? This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we are to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. When I read this scripture, the first thing I thought about was my wife. Now, I love my wife. She's incredible. But I want to let you guys know, she would not let me get away with loving her with just words. It doesn't matter how much I pour my heart out. Like, honey, I love you. I'm so grateful for you, all these things. She's going she's gonna to look at me like, show me the car facts. She's like, you got to show me that you actually love me. Like, I don't want to hear your words. I want to see your actions. See, love is the true measure of your closeness to God. It is the mark of a true disciple of Jesus. But it is, it is impossible to imitate the love of Jesus if you don't imitate his relationship with God. Like it, do, it doesn't get realer than that. But actions speak louder than words. And again, Jesus impacted people by his love more than he ever did by his words. That's why Jesus had authority. Because it wasn't like he was like this big, boastful guy. It's that he loved so much that everything he said, it came with authority because it came with love. In 1 John chapter 4, it says, we love because he first loved us. So this is the truth of the matter. Love will always be inconvenient, but so is going to the cross. And as I close out here, I want you guys to understand that if we're going to move powerfully in this church, if God is going to continue to do incredible things, we need faith, hope, and love. But it says love is the greatest of them because faith and hope does not even exist without love. Right. See, without the love of God, that would be nothing to even have faith in in the first place. Without the love of God, there would be no hope for any of us. All of us will be eternally condemned. But how do you know you have the love of Christ in you? How do you know? I'm not going to tell you. You, gotta, you, know, you, know what to get, you know what it is. I don't have to tell you. There's something I want you to think about. So you would never really love until you love someone who hates you. And so I want to challenge you today. If you really want to grow in your love, don't just love the people that love you. Love those who are your enemy, those who persecute you, those who hate you. I love you guys. To God be the glory. Yeah.